Coming up on Need to Know, you could call it the most watched school in Rochester. East High School is kicking off year two in its collaboration with the U of R. What's planned for this new school year as this innovative intervention continues to unfold? Also on the show, Photonics is now in Rochester and eventually the jobs promised will be here too. We'll tell you how local schools are preparing their students to cash in on the booming industry. And in the midst of continued turmoil and unrest in South Sudan, hope springs forth. How the Rochester South Sudan connection is bringing new opportunities to the youth of Mayanaboon. Need to know starts right now. It's undoubtedly the Rochester school under a microscope right now. East, Ice, East High School has been around for more than a hundred years in our city. The school has graduated everyone from musicians and respected academics to major league sports stars. But in recent years, it's been getting more attention for poor student performance than for the strength of its graduating class. That's why in 2014, the University of Rochester stepped in and agreed to partner with East at a time when it was on the state's list of priority schools in need of an immediate turnaround. Well, it's now the second year of this collaboration under the management of the U of R and joining me in the studio to talk about what's on tap for this new school year is Sean Nelms, the superintendent of East High. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having me. So you walked into a challenging situation and, and challenging maybe an understatement. So I have to begin by asking, why did you want this job as superintendent? You know, it, it's an interesting um, <laughs> it was an interesting dilemma for me. I was in a place in a different district where um, I was creating systems there and I was at a place of comfort and had a personal and work-life balance. Um, and U of R is an institution that I've always admired. I received my master's from there, my doctorate. And um, the dean of school and the president, uh, Joe Selgeman, asked that I consider this project. And I'll be honest, at first I said no. I had um, left the city school district three years prior and I was upset about some of the systemic issues that existed and perhaps my inability to fix those. And East provided an opportunity to not only address those systemic issues, um, but to go at them with the full support of the University of Rochester and the school board and the state education department. And so the conditions were right. And um, I think that the school board and the state and the U of R has done an incredible job in providing resources and time and patience to turn this around. And, um, and, and I'm excited about that. Well, so you've got year one under your belt, mm -hmm. and, and according to local news reports, you gave year one at East a grade of solid. Mm -hmm. So talk about what is working, what yeah. worked that first year. Yeah, I, I think um, our greatest hurdle and challenge was to identify the myriad of issues that caused that failure. And um, schools don't fail overnight. They fail because of um, systemic neglect, possibly, or just sometimes a lack of knowledge and understanding. and and. This past year, we uncovered that the way in which we data track and monitor student progress um, had a lot of room um, uh, for improvement. Uh, how we communicate with families about their child's progress and um, how they're doing academically was an even improvement. Even down to the most um, basic and fundamental expectations that we had for administrators and teachers and ourselves um, was lacking. And so. Um, in year one, we had to uncover all of that, and we could not do it unless we were in the classrooms um, and in those families and um, situations daily. And we took year one to do just that, and we made changes, um, some mid-year changes this year because of it, and uh, we hope that some of the um, root causes are now being identified, and year two would be a much better year. And so in terms of those root causes, mm -hmm. um, what, what have been identified as, yeah. as some of the issues that you're trying to you know, really, yeah. really address um, this new year? Unfortunately, I think in large uh, school settings, there becomes a culture of mediocrity that's accepted. And we started to normalize failure in ways that we celebrated incremental, very low yield um, outcomes. And 
and I had the fortunate opportunity to work in two other districts in Monroe County. And so I had a standard coming to the city that um, was more aligned with kids who are moving on to college and career um, uh, lives than those in the city who often we celebrate graduation as the end. And uh, you know, the word commencement means to begin, not to end. And I think that, um, that all those things, all those factors um, that I learned in, in suburban settings, bringing them to, to, to East and back to the city and just simply saying, how are we tracking students? Um, do we know what the credit requirements are for individuals? Um, and then what are we doing to catch kids up and also accelerate them so they can get admission into better universities and, um, and better um, employment opportunities? And so, and so just for the city itself, there were just a myriad of issues that were identified. Um, and, and I would say that our students fail because the systems were failing them. I know that you have this motto at the school, all in, all yeah. the time. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, does that include input from students? Do, do yeah. they get to say to you, uh, you know, we're dealing with this issue or this right. issue, we, we have a problem here. Yeah. Um, so if so, what are they saying to you? Yeah. And, and how are you addressing those right. things? And, and the students have been incredible. So we surveyed nearly every student the year before we entered um, East, and we surveyed them again this year. And there were some things that were uh, ch children that, that, that find important, like school lunch. Um, they complained <laughs> about the important. food. They wanted better food, and, um, right. and, and but they also had some very serious um, and, and more um, more concerning uh, issues as well, um, including the adult student interaction, um, a sense of not being treated fairly or being heard, or um, the assumption of guilt um, with every adult interaction. That became a, a large topic for them. Um, so how they, do you fix something like that? Well, we, we actually spent the entire summer last year and all um, this, this past year training our staff and restorative practices. Yeah. And the whole idea behind that is to restore relationships between and among students, between and among students and adults, and then between adults themselves. And I think that restorative practice is often associated with um, not suspending kids. And I think people miss the point when they talk about restorative practice in the same breath as suspension. Um, it's really about creating an environment where everyone has an equal voice. I'm in a unique situation as superintendent where I represent each stakeholder group equally. And I will tell staff that I, I am not an extension of administration. I am not an extension of the teacher or the student. I represent the student, the family, the teacher, and administration equally. And so if a student has an issue and they're in the right, then we're going to move based on them being in the right. And if they're wrong, we're going to help them understand why that decision was wrong and then help them make decisions, better decisions later. And, and that's a shift in our building as well. We're really trying to um, create this all in, all the time feel, which really means everyone has equal voice, at least has a process, equal process to voice their concerns, but also the things that they celebrate daily. And, um, and I think students will say to you that they have, we have responded, we have improved um, some of the lunch um, options. Uh, we have created environments where students have an outlet for um, sharing um, their personal feelings and thoughts about ideas. We have a structure called Family Group, where each uh, adult, including myself, we have 10 students that we meet with every single day for the entire school year. And um, we, the adults serve as the carent, the caring parent, play on words. And uh, it's an equal place. In that room, the students call him by my first name. We talk about um, social, political, academic issues. And it just breaks down the barrier between adult and students that often exist and provides opportunities for students to feel empowered in the school process. There was a, a point in time, and you, just, you said this when we got started, where you weren't sure if he would ever come back to, right, to right. the Rochester City School System. And I read this interview with you in Post Magazine earlier mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said, in environments where kids come from affluence and support, mm -hmm. the conversations are focused on the kids. Mm -hmm. But then environments where kids need the most support and the most advocates mm -hmm. in their corner, um, the conversations were more so about the adults. Right. So if you can't kind of explain that, what you mean by that, and what mm -hmm. a conversation about an adult looks like, it uh, sounds like, and it Second, is that statement relevant today, considering mm -hmm. you know East still is a Rochester school? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, again, when we normalize failure and we accept mediocrity, we start to glorify excuses. And we may compare you know, East students to another city school when that other city school may be way off the national norm. Um, we talk about um, kids 
as if they are the problem and we're there to fix them as, as opposed to identifying what their strengths are and building upon that. Um, in, in urban schools, because of the historic uh, failure and some of the systems that are in place, and to be honest, I know teachers have some very well-intentioned teachers who um, have for years tried to implement systems to improve instruction and discipline, and they have felt like they haven't been heard. And, um, and so you, you start to create this group think where the issue becomes about what kids can't do as opposed to what they can do. In other affluent environments, um, there's an expectation that students will move on to something if it's work or college. And so the conversations are about that and preparing kids for that, that outcome. Um, and it's just unfortunate that in large urban settings, um, Rochester in particular, um, we have focused on just getting kids out the door or um, and not really talk, talking about what happens next in their lives. And I'm more concerned, honestly, what happens um, after high school than I am with students um, in their K-12 experience, because those are the things that um, can either change generational um, poverty and trajectory, or they can continue them. And so it's my job to prepare them for life well beyond high school and well into adulthood. I want to drill down with you in terms of the things, the, the gains that have been made and then where yeah. you still see gaps and you want to work towards yeah. those things. Um, so that being said, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I was in East High School maybe three years ago okay. was the last time and I was covering the story, what's going to happen to East? That was yeah. the big question. Okay. So how would the school look different to me now, uh, you know, versus mm -hmm. then? Mm -hmm. and, and are there things that you could say, you know, we've made these gains since that time, right. but these are things that we still really need to hone in yeah, on. Yeah, I'll speak to a couple of gains. So we, as part of our EP agreement with the state and the school board, um, we have mandated professional development hours for teachers during the summer. And this is not busy time. This is um, teachers working with other teachers and some administrators around building curriculum and enhancing instruction, looking at assessments. And so we will walk into, if you walk into East um, this school year, you would see teachers having some consistent expectations around instruction. You would see them collaborating in ways that, um, that push and challenge them, themselves um, instructionally and educationally. Uh, you'll see students um, um, providing feedback on lessons. Lesson plans are posted so that teachers can share them among different service providers. Um, so you would see an academic shift that's really focused on teachers leading the charge, the teacher leader model, um, providing kids adequate support. You would see a shift um, this year in in how we remediate students but also accelerate them. We have this robust um, structure called support and uh, it's an opportunity for students to get extra attention academically for those who are accelerated or those who are behind. When you have 98% of your students not proficient in literacy, it's not a special ed issue, it's a school-wide issue. And so we have to provide those opportunities for all students. And so we have that, and that's for students, they have that support period depending on their need, one, two, or three times within a week, um, if, or within a given day depending. Um, you would see um, hallways um, being managed in a thoughtful, caring way and it's, not, it's no longer a police state. And so um, security officers don't have the right to, to suspend students or to yell at students. Um, it's our job to, to meet with them and to try to correct behavior. And if a student is defiant and out of control, then absolutely a suspension sometimes is the option, but it's not the first option. Suspension is a pretty serious offense. To remove a, a student from a setting is a serious offense, and it can't be level one. Uh, it can't be a level one response, and, and that was um, part of the norm, as reported by students, as reported by staff, and as reported by our, um, our, our school and safety and security. Um, I think also you'll see um, a greater, a greater attention paid to um, community involvement. We have a ton of providers um, at East who have some are there voluntarily, some are through contract, who are focused on trying to deal with some of the behavioral health issues that exist in public schools, um, issues around trauma, yeah. issues around basic dental and, and, and physical needs. And we've expanded that um, last year. The University of Rochester Medical Center, um, under the direction of uh, President Seligman, has poured tons of resources, time, energy, and also financial resources into enhancing um, our ability to meet the most basic and fundamental needs of our students. And that's just among many things that you'll see if you were to visit. And before we close, sorry, it's about 30 seconds. Oh, what is your one challenge for this year? What would you say, you yeah. talked about the gains, mm -hmm. what's an area you would say this is gonna be a hurdle for us this year? I would say we have to still focus on attendance. We need kids in the seats. Our attendance did improve, yeah. but um, not enough. And I think um, getting students to find school relevant and parents to find school relevant becomes a challenge and engaging them in that process is something that we will continue to work on. It's not an excuse, but it is an obstacle. 
exciting times at East High School, and there's much going on, and that means much to track and report on for WXXI News, so we'll look forward to having you back you. in the near future. A special thank you to my guest, Sean Nelm, Superintendent of East High School in partnership with the University of Rochester. Well, if you talk to a Rochester teacher or professor of optics, they'll tell you that now's the best time to join the industry. That's because the AIM Photonics Initiative is here and a $600 million state and federal investment is bringing Rochester back to its roots as the imaging capital of the world. WXXI's Sasha Ann Simons joins us now with more on how schools are preparing for it all. Adding courses and changing programs. These are some of the tweaks being made at local high schools and colleges to help take their optics programs to new heights. Now the highly specialized jobs promised by our new photonics hub aren't here yet. They'll come in the next couple of years. But that isn't stopping local employers from helping their staff brush up on the skills they'll need. And as you'll see in this story, schools are doing what they can to help nearly anyone join the wave and jump into the field. Take a look. Thank you very much. Please all have a seat. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, With the announcements of new federal and state funding last year, Rochester is well on its way to becoming a photonics hub. It's also no surprise that at Monroe Community College, there's been an increase in enrollment in the optics program. Last year, 15 students were in my class, and I'm looking right now at 44 students. Dr. Alexis Vogt's classes gear students toward a certificate or degree in optics. The program has been around since the 1960s, a time when companies like Kodak and Xerox put Rochester, New York's imaging capabilities in the global spotlight. Vogt is especially busy getting the word out about the program, now that the buzzword photonics has brought curiosity and new excitement to the area. Photonics is a subset of optics. Specifically, it's the science and application of light. It can make devices like computers, cell phones, and medical instruments faster and more energy efficient. We had always called it electro-optics, so they're synonyms, but now we are changing our names to reflect that more popular word photonics that we hear. MCC's Optics and Photonics Systems Technology program teaches students how to grind and polish glass and turn it into a lens. They come from diverse backgrounds. Some enroll right out of high school, some work at optics companies and require additional training, and there are others who have switched careers entirely. For John Sharenko, life after retirement from a career in finance was short-lived. So, okay, what do I do now? So, I, literally, I retired for four days. I said, this, this is not working for me. After more than two decades spent crunching numbers in the accounting department at Bosch & Lom, Sharenko is now counting the number of credits he'll earn when he graduates with an electro-optics degree in 2017. So I take uh, six optics courses, seven optics courses, six electronics courses, a couple math courses, four liberal arts. So it really adds up to a lot of, uh, a lot of credit hours. Though he had a knack for the sciences in his undergrad years, the switch to optics is no walk in the park. I've never soldered before. I've never, you know, hooked up transistors on a breadboard with little teeny wires. I had to go out and buy a, um, a magnifying glass. Hands-on training is the key to success in optics. The average starting salary in the field is $35,000 a year. And the more future optical technicians know before entering the workforce, the better their chances of getting hired. Local companies like Sidor Optics have openings currently available. We just don't have qualified uh, people to fill those openings. Jim Sidor looks to colleges to find summer interns and future employees. Yeah, sure. He's also hired people who first learned about optics early on through so, a dual enrollment program that allows high schoolers to take classes that also count as college credits. They're used to handling optical components. They know what, what the optics is doing um, uh, as opposed to somebody coming off the street that has never handled a piece of glass before or measured a piece of glass. This is highly technical. We are dealing with tolerances of millionths of an inch. It's that structure and attention to detail that Sharenko enjoys, and the reason he's not living out his earned right to be sitting on a beach somewhere hot. Like technology, get a degree, get the job. Boom. That's it. Vote is going beyond her duties at the college and doing her part to start them young. Flight. The diffraction grading is separating that white light into all of its individual colors. She's working on having the next generation fill the middle skills gap by getting kindergarten kids interested in science. 
So I come with an optics suitcase, as we call it, it little hands-held demonstrations that students can hold, they can see, uh, they can hold something up to the light and they see a rainbow pattern that forms when they're using a rainbow peephole. And each time, Vote hopes that this important first impression will be a lasting one. For the Innovation Trail, I'm Sasha Ann Simons. This story was part of Innovation Trail, a reporting project that explores the link between technological breakthroughs and the revitalization of upstate New York. See more at innovationtrail.org. Well, the African nation of South Sudan is rarely devoid of international media coverage. According to the United Nations, the humanitarian crisis in the young country continues to deteriorate. And political strife intended to be resolved through a peace deal over a year ago hasn't stopped the deadly violence between the government and rebel forces. But some South Sudanese natives say it's important to offset the international dialogue with stories they say aren't being covered, stories of hope and stories of positive change. One of those South Sudanese natives who calls Rochester home is a familiar face to viewers, and that's Sebastian Morondi. The co-founder of the local nonprofit Building Minds in South Sudan is in the studio to talk about new developments in the world of education in Mayanabun, South Sudan. And welcome back to the show, Sebastian. Thank you. So you have relatives living in South Sudan. You're in contact with them and varied members of government um, on a frequent basis. What are they saying about the current state uh, of the young nation? Because media outlets are saying this civil war is continuing. Um, is it, that how you it also is, describe it? It is actually continuing, but that's a good news for a peace that was signed a couple of months ago, and it seemed to be improving, even though there is a few clashes in the east side of the Nile and the capital within the country, but it seemed to be improving. The UNICEF, the UN Children's Agency, has warned that children are being recruited by all sides uh, of the civil war in South Sudan, and they're saying that includes the government, and they've estimated that 16,000 kids have been recruited as child soldiers since December. And I wanted to get your take on that, because um, I know you said to me in the past, you have concerns sometimes about media coverage and, and the accuracy of it. So is that is that as severe, or is that different than what you're being told? I wouldn't doubt that there's some, in some cases, that could happen, but not what I know. I asked the senior official whether this is happening and it should, if it's happening, it should stop because it's time for his children to go to school, not to fight. And um, it could be some generals who are taking their responsibility in their hand instead of following gov government procedures that are doing that. But it seemed like they're pushing the word and not releasing to cut that up. But in rebel side, there's one general in Northern Alpha Nile that actively doing that. But it's actually not, a co according to what I learned, it's not connected to the vice, former vice president or rebel leader. It's so this not is a totally different issue yes. from the, the political uh, strife that we've been covering here yes, and that yeah. gets covered Bear constantly. Bit, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you, we've reported on, on your work in depth over the past few years. Our original documentary, Schools for South Sudan, uh, will re-air this weekend. Uh, I traveled to your home village to, to document the story. And an update for viewers, something that they may not know, uh, is that the Ajong Primary School, so this is the very first school your nonprofit built through donations, uh, mm -hmm. much that came from the Rochester region. More than 800 kids are now enrolled in the school. And according to your records, that's the largest enrollment of any primary school in, in the South country. Sedan. Yeah. So far, yeah. So what's drawing kids and, and what's getting them to not only attend but to continue coming back? Because as you know here in the city of Rochester, attendance is a major issue. Well, there's two different things. Here in the U.S., children uh, never experience difficulties or they are not seeing what children in South Sudan are seeing. In South Sudan case, every child know the situation they are in is because their parents are not educated. So this is a push. The situation is pushing them to school. If you meet a child in the village, he or she will say, take me to go to school. I want to go to school. The same thing, that's why building my new student start to begin with. Because the child comes to me and says, you took your brother to Kenyan school. What about us? It was a question from a child, not a doll. So the situation is forcing children to go to school. And that's the reason, yeah. 
Well, you've done live teacher training programs between yeah. South Sudan and the U.S. You've launched a Pads for Girls initiative, and this is so that young women during their menstrual cycle can still go to school because it is yeah. not like it is here where you can go to a drugstore and get a sanitary pad. And so you, young women are learning how to make their own. Yeah. And now you're preparing for a very special opening in February of 2017, and that's a girls' school. So that's, yeah, congratulations so, on that, first of all. And tell you. us And tell us about it. Well, we actually did a groundbreaking this year and we built some classes at the girls' school. It was historic in Vance, and not only that, it was emotional to me. Because in that culture, there's no way a woman could come to you and say, I wanted to take over this. This is our cause, this is our programs. When I went to South Sudan last year, they talked to me on the phone, and when I arrived in the village, they says, the groundbreaking of girls' school have to be done on our way, women way. And over 600 women and girls dance all day and all evening hours. And what I had to do was to give them funds to buy food items to and to dance. It, it was historic events. And I promised them something that I shouldn't do all the time, that as long as I'm alive, I will do anything for your prosper in that region. Because country is a woman. South Sudan is not he. South Sudan is she and we have to give Chi an education. I want to find out in terms of funding and, and continuing to sustain the school, how does it work? Because I know that much support comes from, from here in the U.S., here in the United States, um, but it, it also support comes from the government. And given kind of the economic uh, situation in South Sudan right now, how are these schools, how will the girls' school, how is Ajang really keeping itself going? South Sudan government is still funding teachers' programs. They still pay teachers. Our, our side is to build schools and provide fat for girls as well as encouragement. In the U.S. side, we were lucky, especially for girls' school, to get grant for $124,000. And I couldn't believe when I heard that news. And uh, thanks to these women groups in Midwest that support uh, our programs. And my hope is by next year, by the end of 2017, the girls' school should finish. That's my hope. And before we close, big news that you just told me prior to starting our conversation today, uh, there's plans for another school after that. After girls' school, we're going for high school because both two schools are elementary school. And you cannot educate child to eighth grade. So we better build a high school for them. Right. We're going to have two schools. Well, congratulations to you and, and to the work that you're doing through Building Minds in South Sudan. A special thank you to my guest, Sebastian Morondi. He's the co-founder of the Rochester-based nonprofit Building Minds in South Sudan. You can learn more about his work. Go to BMISS.org. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the weekend. And if you ever miss an episode, just go online to WXXINews.org and click on the Need to Know link to check out the entire show or your favorite segment. Have a good night.